Howdy, everyone. Hello. My name is Danica Katovich. I'm Code Pink's national co-director. Um, Code Pink is joining our partners in declaring it Daniel Ellsberg Week to honor him, his long life of truth and activism, and all whistleblowers who, at great personal risk, dared to tell people of the world the truth um, about uh, U.S. wars, militarism, um, surveillance, etc. Um, in 1971, Daniel Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers, documenting decades of lies and mistakes in Vietnam. In 91, he faces a new battle, an operable cancer. Dan Ellsberg was given months to live, and he uses his last months doing what he does best and what he's been doing for decades, raising the threat of nuclear war and giving the peace movement a great foundation of truth to stand on. Today, we have a great lineup of speakers to honor Dan Ellsberg and to raise up the importance of whistleblowers. We'll have time for questions at the end uh, at the, of the whole program. Uh, we'll be a, about an hour, so we'll use about the last 15 to 20 minutes for questions. Um, and uh, until then, please put questions in the chat, as, uh, in the Q&A section as they come up, and I'll also be monitoring the chat for your questions as well. First, it's my honor to introduce Jesselyn Raddick. Jesselyn is an American national security and human rights attorney known for her defense of whistleblowers, journalists, and hacktivists, including Daniel Hale, who is currently serving out an almost four-year sentence for leaking damning information about the U.S. drone program. Jesselyn graduated from Brown University and Yale Law School and began her career as an honored program attorney at the U.S. Department of Justice. And with that, I will pass it to Jesselyn. Hi, I'm glad to be here, but sad for the occasion, given um, Dan Ellsberg's declining health and given that Daniel Hale um, is still in prison. Um, you know, it's Dan Daniel Ellsberg, when I was investigated at, um, for leaking information, Daniel Ellsberg was the first person to reach out to me. And he literally just called me at home. It was like, Hi, this is Dan Ellsberg, and, and you know, started explaining who he was, and I'm like, oh my God, I know who you are. Like, I just studied you in my political science class. I just wrote a paper on you, and but that willingness to kind of go the extra mile. I mean, a lot of people go through a whistleblowing ordeal, and they are so battered and bruised and bankrupt and broken from the whole thing that they wanna leave the experience behind them understandably. And to his credit, um, Dan Ellsberg has continued to mentor an entire generation of people who have been going through the living hell of whistleblowing. And like he reached out to me when Daniel first showed up on my doorstep in 2014, that was the first person I called was Dan Ellsberg to talk to Daniel Hill because I knew that he was uniquely positioned to understand the problems um, of being charged under the Espionage Act, especially when you were acting in a patriotic and truthful way to expose grave wrongdoing. Um, so again, I mean, he, he has been just a generational mentor and I think a kind of a, just a, a sign of strength and a, a standard bearer, a friend, a confidant. Um, and I know speaks frequently with Daniel Hale. You know, in terms of Daniel Hale, his prosecution continues to be one of the most unjust under the Espionage Act, um, except for reality winner, he is serving the stiffest jail sentence. Um, for basically revealing truthful information to the press about the U.S. targeted um, killing program and how the U.S. deceives the public about the targeting and the effectiveness and uh, the casualties uh, of the drone program, consistently exaggerating how accurate it is and underreporting civilian deaths. Um, the fact that his case has dragged out for so long, I mean, it's almost punishment by process because again, like 
the search of his house was back in 2014 and here we are you know it's 2023 um so it's been almost a decade and i would argue punishment by process and just the sword of damocles hanging over daniel's head all those years waiting for for the inevitable to happen um and then just having one of the harshest outcomes um has been really hard mostly on Daniel, but I thought his case was significant because it was the first time a judge recognized him or any defendant I've represented as an actual whistleblower. Um, the judge also had recommended that he be put in a minimum security facility um, and in a medical prison, and which I thought was very generous of the judge and compassionate but the Bureau of Prisons had to exact its pound of flesh and ended up sending him to this Orwellian communications management unit um, that is nicknamed Gitmo North and designed to house terrorists. So it just shows that, you know, some, someone who's a pacifist like Daniel with no priors, um, the U.S. is still just going to treat him as harshly as possible. Um, and in the CMU where he's currently housed, he's far more isolated from his support network, unable to receive the medical care he desperately needs and even the judge recognized he needed and has so many more restrictions on him than most prisoners do. Um, you know, I think in the grand scheme of whistleblowing, um, like Dan Ellsberg, Daniel Hale, will be remembered favorably by history. And I know that's of cold comfort um, when you're in a spiral of unfairness that seems to have no bottom, um, but I've never seen someone more deserving of a case um, for a pardon um, and an apology from his country and actually a thank you. Um, I will continue to support Daniel unfailingly um, till my dying breath. I mean, he's a, a stand-up person who has paid an enormous, horrible price for doing the right thing. Thank you, Jessalyn, and thanks for highlighting uh, Daniel Hale, the drone whistleblower, uh, who's actually serving his sentence like five hours uh, south of me. Um, I'm in Chicago, and he's in uh, Marion, Illinois. Um, so next we have, um, I'm really excited to introduce John Kiriakou. John is a former CIA officer, former senior investigator for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and former counterterrorism consultant for ABC News. In 2007, Kiriakou blew the whistle on the CIA's torture program, telling ABC News that the CIA tortured prisoners, that torture was official U.S. government policy, and that the policy had been approved by then-President George W. Bush. He became the sixth whistleblower indicted by the Obama administration under the Espionage Act. He served 23 months in prison as a result of the revelation. And I will pass it to John and spotlight him. There we go. Thanks. Thanks, Danica. And thanks, everybody. I I, uh, I was honored to even be considered to uh, speak about Dan Ellsberg, the great Dan Ellsberg, and, uh, and jumped at the opportunity. Uh, I've told this story before, so forgive me if it's if it's a repeat for you. But when I was when I was a little kid, or all the years that I was growing up, um, my my parents insisted that we always have dinner as a family every night. There were five of us. I have a brother and sister, both younger than I am, and um, and every day, my my dad, who was an elementary school principal, and my mom, who was an elementary school teacher, um, would would come home around four. My mom would make uh, dinner, and we would all sit down to eat. And we would always talk about the events of the world. Even when I was a little kid, one of my earliest memories was asking my dad why there were so many fires on TV. And he told me that someone had shot Martin Luther King and that people were very angry about this. But one of the things that that has stuck in my mind over these many years, 52, 53 years now, um, was about Dan Ellsberg. Uh, Dan Ellsberg was a hero in our family. 
And I remember my father, when I was only six years old, explaining to me that this man, this one man, had decided to tell the American people the truth when everybody else was lying about the truth. Now, my mom came from a very large family. Um, I have 27 first cousins on my mom's side. And many of them, seven of them, of the 27, uh, fought in Vietnam and thought that they were fighting in Vietnam for the right reasons and believed what they were being told, that we were the good guys. We were on the side of righteousness. We were there to protect the American people and to protect the American way of life. And we were winning. And all of that was a lie. And we didn't even know it was a lie until Dan Ellsberg told us. So this was revelatory. And my parents made sure that we understood, even at those young ages, that Daniel Ellsberg was a bona fide American hero. That was in 1970, of course. And as I got older, I was interested in, in current events and in foreign affairs. I, I knew I wanted to do something in foreign affairs, and I ended up going to college in Washington at George Washington University. And Dan Ellsberg, every once in a while, would come to D.C., and he would speak at Georgetown or George Washington University or American University. And many of us would always make the pilgrimage to go see Dan Ellsberg. You know, Dan would speak and sometimes debate with people like Abby Hoffman, for example, uh, you know, people who had gone through similar experiences, but from a different angle. And he was always a, a, a beacon of, of light and of hope in transparency and in truthfulness. I never thought that I would ever have the opportunity to actually meet the man. And I didn't want to be, you know, a stalker and wait until after the speech was done to stand there and fawn all over him and such. But I mean, privately, I did fawn all over him. He was a hero to me. I had a similar experience to Jessalyn's experience. When I got in trouble and I got arrested, uh, I got together for dinner one night with Jess and with Tom Drake and uh, Kevin Gastala and uh, a couple of other people um, here in Washington. And Dan called in to say hello and to wish me well. It was the first time I'd ever spoken to Daniel Ellsberg. And it was like meeting a rock star. Listen, I'm not um, I'm not one to be starstruck by people. I, over the course of my career, I I met with kings and presidents and prime ministers, and it's just not that big of a deal. But it was a big deal to meet Dan Ellsberg. This is a guy who literally put his life on the line for truth and for transparency. It's a man I had looked up to from the age of six. And I got to meet him over the phone. Well, I went to prison in early 2013. And one of the first letters that I received was from Dan. And Dan wrote to me regularly, religiously, faithfully. And one of the things that was just so wonderful was that he would always close his letters by saying, love, Dan. The letters were always typed, but at the bottom, he would handwrite, love, Dan. And I used to think, what a warm and wonderful thing that he's doing. It got to the point where, you know, the prison guards always read your mail and sometimes they, you know, don't give it to you or they alter it or they cut things out or black things out as Jesselyn can well attest. Uh, thanks to Jesselyn, I was able to smuggle a lot of my, my letters out of, uh, out of prison to Jess. And, um, and finally, one of the guards said to me, listen, uh, you know, I'm probably not supposed to tell you this, but your buddy is, um, is at the college down the street. I was in FCI Loretto, Pennsylvania, the Federal Correctional Institution at Loretto, Pennsylvania. And there was a small um, Catholic college there, St. I forget, Vincent's maybe? I don't know. It had like 10 people in it. And it used to be a Catholic monastery. Uh, but it was down the street. And that's where the guys in the minimum security work camp uh, worked as janitors. And I said, who's my friend? at the at the university and he said your friend he's speaking at the university this ellsberg guy and i said dan's in town i couldn't believe it 
And then this prison guard, and the prison guards, listen, are not there to be your friends. They're, in most cases, your enemies. This prison guard actually cut the article out of the local newspaper to give to me so I could see the transcript of Dan's speech and the response to, to a visit to this little tiny town with 1,200 people in it by this American giant, this, this giant of modern American history. It was actually a warm and, and very thoughtful thing to do. So here we are more than a decade later, and uh, I can't tell you how proud I am to call Dan not, not just a, a, an idol for me. I mean, do 58-year-old men have idols? I can tell you that, yeah, we do. Uh, but I'm proud to call him a friend. It, it's heartbreaking that he's ill and that he's suffering right now. But I spoke to him last week, and, I, and I, I'm glad that I had the opportunity to tell him that even going through the process of death, he's doing it with such dignity and such grace, with an eye toward the greater good, that even in these final weeks of his life, he continues to be a role model for all of us. You know, besides my own father, And my grandfather, there have only been two people in my life who have impacted me like this. Pete Seeger is one. And I'm honored to say that Pete Seeger and I became friends toward the end of his life. And Dan Ellsberg being the other. I'm I'm a better person because I've had Dan Ellsberg in my life. And, um, you know, even though he's not going to be with us for too terribly much longer, we're lucky in that we have his books. We have his speeches, and we have the testimony from so many people whose lives he impacted uh, to fall back on. Like I say, not just I feel that I'm a better person having known him, but I think all of us are better people having been touched by him. So thanks for inviting me. I'm I'm really thrilled that I got the chance to uh, to say something. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, And yeah, thank you for highlighting how much just light that Dan Ellsworth has brought to this situation. Sorry if you hear all the honking. I live in Chicago uh, and there's a Cubs game. So um, uh, I really recommend everyone on Dan Ellsberg's Twitter. He posted this letter that he wrote um, to his movement friends originally, and then it was getting circulated. So he posted it for everyone. This letter he wrote about his life and how he's making this transition um, and just his reflections. It's a very, very beautiful letter. Um, he posted on his Twitter and I think it's been published elsewhere. Um, but I really, really recommend checking that out. Um, and our third panelist is here with us, Gabriel Shipton. Uh, Gabriel's a film producer and the brother of WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange. His feature length documentary entitled Ithaca premiered at the Sydney Film Festival and opened for general release in January of 2022. It follows the work of his father, John Shipton, in fighting for Julian's release. And with that, I will pass it to Gabriel. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I mean, it's um, it's an honor to be amongst, uh, you know, John and and Jesslyn. um, speaking about uh, this great uh, titan of uh, of the U.S., a hero uh, to many, and also a, a, a thorn in the side uh, to uh, you know the you know, military-industrial complex and those who uh, those who we want to hide, uh, you know, what the government is doing in our names. Now I've uh, I've. I haven't known Dan uh, probably as long as John or, or Jesslyn, but I can really uh, echo uh, similar stories that they have. His, you know, undying and and committed support uh, for truth tellers, uh, for whistleblowers, and uh, for people like Julian, people who are, you know, imprisoned unjustly uh, for uh, publishing the truth. Now. Uh, Dan was the last person, I believe, to beat an Espionage Act charge, uh, and that was almost 50 years ago. And Julian is charged under the same Espionage Act. He's charged with 17 uh, charges under the Espionage Act for uh, sourcing and publishing 
uh, classified uh, information uh, leaks uh, related to uh, the Chelsea Manning leak. So that's the Afghan uh, war logs, uh, the Iraq war diaries, uh, the diplomatic cable set of State Department uh, diplomatic cables, as well as Guantanamo Bay uh, detainee files. And for publishing uh, that information, uh, Julian faces 175 years uh, maximum sentence uh, if, he, if he is convicted. Now, you know, as, uh, Dan is still a, uh, a very much still a troublemaker uh, in, in every sense. Last June, uh, he did an interview with uh, BBC Hard Talk, which is a, a, a quite a large program in, in the United Kingdom, where he admitted that Julian had given him an exact uh, backup of uh, the Chelsea Manning leaks, uh, the exact uh, leaks that Julian is uh, now being pursued uh, for publishing. He had given uh, a, a, an entire backup to Daniel Ellsberg, uh, and and then uh, went on BBC Hard Talk and and said, you know, I should be charged as well. You should be if you're charging Julian Assange under the Espionage Act for possessing this material, uh, then you should be charging me. So, even even to this day, Dan is uh, you know out there causing trouble, and I, I hope that you know, I'm sure he's got something planned. Uh, he's going to go out with a bang. I, I'm 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 definitely sure about that. If if we've learned anything from uh, you know his his brilliant uh, his brilliant life uh, that he has led. Now, I, I I met Dan at his house uh, in 20, you know, 2021. My father and I went to uh, visit him there, and and you know he was very uh, generous with his time and sat with us for a few hours. It was during the COVID period, so you know at at uh, great risk to himself in his in his um, you know delicate old age but he was very generous to his time. And I think one interesting thing he said, uh, or that I asked him about his case, you know, about his um, case, uh, his Espionage Act case, and, and, and how he was being pursued for, the pen, uh, for leaking the Pentagon Papers. Uh, people often talk about Julian's case, the need for a face saver uh, uh, for the government or for the, for the DOJ or the National Security State uh, that is pursuing Julian, and I asked Dan, you know, what what was the face saver in your case? Uh, you know, how, how did what was the face saver that you know let the government sort of slip out of uh, your prosecution? And Dan looked at me confused, <laughs> and he said, "Well, what, what, you know, what are you talking about? You know, Nixon was impeached, and and what he meant was that the plumbers uh, who." Uh, you know, who had spied on um, Daniel Ellsberg's uh, psychiatrist, which led to his, uh, his case being thrown out of court, uh, ended up part of uh, Nixon's impeachment. And we can really look at similarities, uh, the similarities in Julian's case, in the sense that uh, during uh, the Trump administration under, under CIA director Mike Pompeo, uh, there was an unprecedented statement by Pompeo that he declared WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence service. And what that meant was that the CIA could use clandestine operations uh, to uh, pursue WikiLeaks. Uh, similarly, uh, what, like operations they would use against, say, the, you know, the Iranian Secret Service or the Russian FSB. And so what that meant was that the CIA then co-opted the security company uh, that was supposed to be protecting Julian in the Ecuadorian embassy. Julian spent seven and a half years in the Ecuadorian embassy. He was taken from there in 2019 and put in uh, Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison where he remains to this day uh, four years. He spent four years there on the 11th of April. But during his time in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, this clandestine operation began where you see Global, this security company, uh, began spying on Julian. Uh, they updated all the cameras in the embassy to high definition cameras. Uh, they placed microphones all throughout the embassy to record uh, Julian's conversations, uh, his legally privileged conversations uh, with his lawyers, 
uh, and with his doctors. And what we later found out uh, was that there were also plots uh, to kidnap Julian uh, that were circulating within uh, the CIA that made it all the way to the Trump White House. And these plots to kidnap Julian uh, were met with, uh, you know, there's some reporting about this. Uh, some Yahoo News reporters did a very, very long investigation, 6,000 word piece uh, that it was nominated for some journalism prizes. And they reported that uh, these plots to kidnap Julian were discussed at the highest levels, uh, discussed with the DOJ. Uh, and they reported that the DOJ responded to the Pompeo CIA that, uh, you know, what are you going to do when you kidnap Julian? Uh, where are you going to take him? We don't have any charges. Just wait a bit and uh, we'll bring some charges and then you can get him out of the embassy. And so we can see this sort of uh, judicial kidnapping that was put in place uh, to uh, take Julian from the embassy and then uh, keep him in prison uh, sort of indefinitely now uh, while he awaits or fights his extradition to the USA. But this sort of corruption of these state entities like uh, the CIA and, and the Department of Justice to pursue what is a political persecution uh, is uh, sort of mirrored in Daniel Ellsberg's case and, and really went to the highest level of the US government in the Trump administration. So I expect uh, that there will be some similar consequences. Well, you know, I, hopefully there will be some similar consequences that were mirrored in Daniel Ellsberg's case, uh, as, as in Julian's case, uh, if, if it ever gets to that level. But yeah, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And I hope, uh, you know, so much admiration uh, for, for Dan and, and all the support that he's given Julian over the years. Uh, he is a great example uh, to whistleblowers uh, everywhere. Um, and, and I think that's very important that he is celebrated uh, in his life and, and uh, continuing uh, just to set an example, really, because what's going on in the world and we wouldn't know much without, without these courageous people, uh, without these truth tellers. And uh, if we don't celebrate them, if we don't protect them, uh, then they won't come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, there's a lot of people in the chat just sending uh, love to your family um, while Thank Julian is in prison. Um, I just wanted to read really quickly just portions of Daniel Ellsberg's um, letter that he wrote, just because I think it was really compelling. I brought it up earlier. Didn't want to leave people hanging. And then we have a really large chunk of time, more than planned for questions, which is really awesome. Uh, not usually how it goes, which is great. Um, so this is just a short excerpt of his letter. Um, when I copied the Pentagon Papers in 1969, I had every reason to think I would be spending the rest of my life behind bars. It was a fate I would have gladly accepted if it meant hastening the end of the Vietnam War, unlikely as that seemed and was. Yet in the end, that action in ways I could not have foreseen due to Nixon's illegal responses did have an impact on shortening the war. In addition, thanks to Nixon's crimes, I was spared the imprisonment I expected, and I was able to spend last, the last 50 years with my wife, Patricia, and my family, and with you, my friends. I was able to devote those years to doing everything I could think of to alert the world to the perils of nuclear war and wrongful interventions. As I look back on the last 60 years of my life, I think there is no greater cause to which I could have dedicated my efforts. For the last 40 years, we have known that nuclear war between the U.S. and Russia would mean a nuclear winter. I'm happy to know that millions of people have the wisdom, dedication, and moral courage to carry on with these causes and to work unceasingly for the survival of our planet and its creatures. And like John said, he did uh, sign off that letter with uh, Love Dan. So um, with that, we'll move to questions. I'm going to give people more time to put them in the Q&A section. Uh, Thomas, I did get your question from the chat so that will be answered. Um, so I'm going to give people a couple minutes and in the meantime I'd like to ask questions to the panelists and I think uh, maybe all three of you could answer. Um, what sort of uh, compels whistleblowers, you know, whether it's like you John or Daniel Hale or Julian Assange or Daniel Ellsberg to make that um, decision to leak it as opposed to just um, see what they saw and hold it back from the public. You know, you 
do risk years and years and some case over a hundred years in prison um, for leaking these things. So what sort of compelled um, either your clients or you or your family members to make that decision? And I'll start with Jess and then John and then Gabriel. Sure. For me, it was a crisis of conscience and I literally was, could not sleep at night knowing that we had tortured someone and that he was going to be like our first prosecution in the war on terrorism and that we had not only tortured him, but covered that up and were concealing it from the court. And so for me, it was just choosing my conscience over my career so I could live with myself and be able to look at myself in the mirror and, you know, go to bed with a clean conscience. It wasn't about like some super love for John Walker Lind or anti being anti Ashcroft or anything like that. It was more having a conscience and, and acting on it. I don't think it was some huge profound act of moral courage. It was just being able to live with myself. I, uh, I never considered myself to be a whistleblower. Jessalyn had to tell me that I was a whistleblower in our very first meeting. And I said to her, as I was walking out of her office, I said, listen, I really want to thank you for for taking my case because I know that you only represent whistleblowers and I'm not a whistleblower. And she said, you're the poster boy for whistleblowing. And I said, no, I just said something. And she had to explain it to me that that's sort of, you know, that's what whistleblowing is. Um, oh boy, where do you even begin? Um, one of the things that I learned early on in the process, and again, I learned this through Jess uh, and through an Israeli journalist who has written about whistleblowers, a guy by the name of A.L. Press, is that whistleblowers have an unusually highly defined sense of right and wrong. It's more highly defined than among the general public. And um, I think Tom Drake would agree with me. I n- I never really gave serious thought to n- not saying something. You know, when Dan talks about about just accepting that he was going to spend the rest of his life in prison, um, it just never occurred to me that maybe I shouldn't say anything on the off chance that I might spend forty five years in prison, which is what the government was originally seeking in my case. Um, there's just in, inside your head, there's just too much going on telling you, you've got to say something. And I actually waited in my case for somebody else to say something. And when nobody did, I thought, well, they're not going to do it. So I guess I have to. Well, I mean, I'm, I can't, I mean, I, I can you know, I don't have this experience that uh, Jess or, or John have, but uh, for me, all the all the people that I've met and all the whistleblowers that I've met advocating for Julian, including um, you know Daniel Hale, who who Jesslyn spoke uh, about earlier, uh, I think that something exists inside, which is a, a yearning for justice and a, and a revulsion of of injustice. And to me, the whistleblowers that I meet and uh, have this sort of fearlessness, and uh, they're 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 courageous uh, in a in a in a in a sort of sense, and that that to me is really the overriding uh, the overriding characteristic that that I've found amongst whistleblowers is that they're fearless and that they're courageous. But I think this this sense of right and wrong exists in inside inside all of us, and what I think part of Julian's work and the work of WikiLeaks was really how do we how do we protect whistleblowers? You know, how do we protect journalists and 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 protect whistleblowers in a digital age? And how do we uh, by protecting them? Uh, how do we encourage uh, other people uh, to become whistleblowers? And I think it's so important uh, what what getting together in forums like this to really celebrate. Uh, to celebrate whistleblowers and to really talk about their courage, uh, but also, uh, you know, have the tools to be able uh, to to protect themselves um, so that uh, 
so that they can uh, whistleblow without the fear of uh, of these um, you know huge tolls on on their lives. Uh, and I think that's uh, very uh, important as well. Thank you. Just letting attendees know, John had to hop off to go to on to go on Katie Helper's podcast, which you should all check out. It's pretty good. Um, so I have a question. Um, Robert asked, "How is Dan Ellsberg doing today?" Um, I don't know if the panelists have an answer to this, but I heard that he was doing. He had a good day today. Um, I don't know if you two have heard anything, but that's what I've heard as of today. Um, so um there we go is robert's question uh and then thomas drake asked what do the panelists feel is the greatest single legacy that dan ellsberg is leaving for us to carry on that's a loaded one <laughs> sorry to drop that on you both but it's a good question Oh, Jess, you're uh, muted. Sorry about that. Um, Dan Ellsberg always said, don't do what I did. Don't wait. Blow the whistle earlier rather than later. If I had blown the whistle earlier, think of how much carnage could have been prevented. Um, and I think a lot of whistleblowers tend to wait or not blow the whistle at all because they see what happens and they have fears about what's going to happen. Um, so to me, that was like a big piece of wisdom that Dan always imparted, like blow the whistle sooner rather than later and trust your, trust your judgment. Um, because I mean, the government's going to lie and say whatever it's going to say, but like trust your own judgment and don't wait. So that was the biggest takeaway for me. Uh, I, uh, Dan's, to me, Dan's uh, legacy is uh, just the, you know, his passion uh, for life and, and really the, the way he has lived his life and, and, and shown that, um, you know, for, for, for many years he worked inside the military industrial complex. Uh, you know, I think he was in his 40s when, when um, the Pentagon Papers were leaked. And so uh, that really even after this leak is a, a life for, for, for leakers and for whistleblowers, uh, people of principle, you don't have to, uh, you know, exist within these uh, organizations or, or uh, you know, these murderous uh, regimes that there is, uh, you know, you don't just blow the whistle and that's it, you know, the, you, you have a legacy and you have a life and really his, his life after the Pentagon Papers is a testament to that and, and a real example to uh, every other whistleblower that, you know, you might go through uh, some hard times, but it, it's worth it. And, and, you know, he's now in his 90s and being constantly celebrated and supporting whistleblowers all over the world. I, I think that that really is, to me, uh, is part of his legacy is, is uh, all the whistleblowers that have followed him. Um, you know, I think He's almost responsible for a lot of them. Uh, you know, as John said, he, he was always a hero uh, to John. So you could really, um, you know, blame Daniel Ellsberg for a lot of a lot of the whistleblowers that exist today. And to me, that is uh, such an incredible, an incredible legacy. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat about if there's any kind of regulation protecting whistleblowers from going to prison, like anywhere in the world that could be implemented here, like if there's any that already exist. Um, and maybe I'll, I don't know if Jesslyn would know the answer to that. Our country is the only country that, I mean, there, UK has an official secrets act, which is kind of like our espionage act, but most countries don't have the concept of a whistleblower. They may have a different word for it, but a lot of countries don't even have that concept. It's uh, a very American concept and a very democratic concept. Um, but so, no, there's not, 
I can't think of like model legislation. U.S. has different people who have put forth different people who are members of Congress um, who have who have put forth, including Defending Rights and Dissent Foundation and Representative Tlaib and people who put forth um, legislation to amend the Espionage Act. But um, in terms, I mean, really, whistleblowing is something that should be protected and technically is protected by law. But the law protecting whistleblowers has no enforcement mechanism. So when the government comes down on you with a ton of bricks, there's really nothing you can do as a whistleblower to stop that. And that's what we need. We need a public interest defense for people who blow the whistle. Thank you, Jess. Um, we also have someone asking specifically about Julian um, asking, there's only six Congress people that signed the letter to the Justice Department to drop the charges against Julian Assange. Do you think the letter still made an impact or anything else to give us hope for Julian? Yeah, yeah, I certainly do. I mean, there were seven, um, seven in total. So, uh, you know, that is, it's a beginning and it's a base of support now that people are on the record of uh, supporting Julian's freedom and calling for this, uh, you know, unprecedented use of the Espionage Act against the publisher uh, to be dropped by the Garland Department of Justice. So, yeah, I definitely think it's uh, it's made an impact. Uh, you know, it will just grow and grow. I think the support in Congress now. We we've got uh, this is a group of progressive uh, progressive Congress people. Um, you know, it includes uh, Rashida Tlaib, who led the letter, uh, Greg Cesar from, from Texas, um, Corey Bush, Jamal Bowman, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, as well as Ilhan Omar. So that's a real uh, group within within the Progressive Caucus that are, that are calling for this. Uh, to, and we know there's been um, some vocal support on, on the other side of the aisle as well amongst people like, you know, Thomas Massey, uh, Representative Ro Khanna as well has spoken out against um, against this as well. So I think you know what Jessalyn was talking about before was this, you know, really reform of the Espionage Act, and and that is uh, really key to protecting whistleblowers, uh, the public interest defence, uh, and protecting publishing, uh, uh, carving out publishing uh, from. Uh, from the Espionage Act as well would be a key reform, and it, it has bipartisan support. You know, Thomas Massey and Ro Khanna had a had a had a uh, Espionage Act reform bill. Uh, I think that uh, they were co-sponsoring in October last year. So really, I think there is a growing um, a growing group within Congress who not only calling for Julian's freedom but also calling uh, for reform of, of the Espionage. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think we have one more question. Um, and then we can wrap it up sort of early unless we get any more. But why did none of the Republicans who have spoken out about it previously support the mo most recent letter? Well, I think it was a Democrat focused letter because of, um, you know, it's a Democratic administration. So it was a focus on uh, on the democratic support, which uh, I think, you know, would have a greatest impact. But I'm looking forward to another letter, perhaps a bipartisan one. Uh, I think that would be um, very impactful as well. I would also mention that I think this whole issue is also getting will be further examined given now that President Biden and former President Trump and Vice President Pence all have recently been found to have classified information that they shouldn't have possessed laying around private property unsecured. And part of that is a function of overclassification, but none of them are being charged under the Espionage Act, nor should they be. Um, because again, in you know, unless you are actually intending to sell such information to a hostile foreign nation or use it to harm the United States, um, people should not be facing prosecution using this law. So, you know, in a way, what's going on in current events is hopefully also going to shine a light or be an impetus behind some reforms. 
Awesome. Um, okay, one more question. Actually, the regular media mainly parrots the government's position. What media covers more of the truth about whistleblowers um, or educates the public more? We got like kind of two of those questions. One was asked by Ket Karen and one by Vera. I think democracy now, I think, um, I mean, alternative liberal media, Kevin Gastola has certainly done a lot of writing about these whistleblower cases that no one has covered. Um, he's done that with Shadow Proof. Chip Gibbons at Defending Rights and Dissent Foundation has also been covering these cases and issues. But yeah, the mainstream media is, is not going to cover it. Um, Unlike the crazy, just worldwide fascination with Snowden, it's generally very hard to get media traction on these stories. And that's by design. The government has a huge megaphone um, and the mainstream media wants to keep its contacts in the government um, and so doesn't want to be too harsh about that. Um, so we, it really is like incumbent and a heavy lift for, but the best reporting is occurring in alternative media and people at the grassroots level who are making waves and keeping these issues alive and shouting from the rooftops like, yeah, they can hide you away in prison, but, you know, Daniel Hale, Julian Assange, people are still suffering from this. Reality winner is still under many restrictions, even though she's technically free, she's still under all sorts of very heavy-handed restrictions. And um, again, that's by design, punishment by process, trying to trip you up. They'll do anything to throw you back in. They want you to fail. Um, you know, and John Kiriakou has written eloquently about that um, also. I don't know if Gabriel wants to add any media yeah, sources. I've, I've, yeah, I think... Uh... Uh, some those are some great ones that Jesslyn was was citing um, about whistleblowing, um, and you know the in, independent media these days is uh, is gaining audience, uh, and really I think the uh, you know we can just have a look at the most recent Discord leaks and and how the uh, you know how the New York Times and 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 places like Bellingcat were were talking about, uh, you know, how they identified whistleblowers and, and how they sought out whistleblowers and identified their information. And, and that really is, um, says to us that, uh, you know, these uh, news organizations, uh, these, the news media has sort of lost their way in that sense. Um, they're no longer uh, protecting sources, um, you know, they're doing the job of uh, the FBI and hunting them down. So uh, I think that's a big sign to everybody that if they really want to uh, get information about uh, whistleblowing or, or whistleblowers or people like Daniel Ellsberg or John Kiriakou or Jesslyn and, their, and the information that they expose, uh, then the independent media is uh, is the place to go. Um, you know, uh, Cy Hirsch, Matt Taibbi, those sorts of people as well uh, who, are, who are doing really good uh, reporting. Thank you both. Um, I want to thank Gabriel and Jesslyn and also John Kiriakou for joining us for this webinar today. Um, we will get it wrapped up now, but it will be up on our YouTube. If you ever want to revisit it or share it, please do. Um, uh, this was to honor uh, the great Daniel Ellsberg. Um, and I just want to highlight all the amazing stories that were shared with us today by all three of our panelists and also just so many people in the chat had personal stories with Dan Ellsberg, which I think just speaks to how ingrained he made himself in the anti-war movement after being a whistleblower. He didn't just whistleblow and dip out on us. He stayed with us for our, his literally his entire life. And we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And I hope that we can take what Dan has given us uh, in his very long life of anti-war work, um, take it with us, take his, um, you know, confidence and competence um, and honestly care as well. Um, you know, he spent so much of his time caring for people and that's sort of the foundation of anti-war work um, is caring about people, not just here, not just yourselves, not just people, you know, but everywhere in the world. So um, Dan, we love you if you're listening. Um, 
and I'll make sure to send it to him as well if he if he wasn't able to tune in today. Um, but thank you to all of our speakers. Um, you can uh, support current whistleblowers uh, today. Also, I will say that you could go to codepink.org slash Daniel Hale um, and you can write to him um, or sign his uh, commutation petition. Um, and I don't know, uh, Gabriel, is there any way that we could support Julian in the next few days? Yeah, if you go to assangedefense.org, um, you can uh, join the mailing list there and find out what actions are taking place. I think there's some things play and plan for uh, World Press Freedom Day, so there should be some um, action taking place around the United States. Uh, Assangedefense.org. Um, yeah. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, that reminds me. Code Pink has a World Press Freedom Day, and Kevin. Russell is actually speaking at it um, on May 3rd. So that's exciting. Jessalyn, do you want to wrap up with anything? Uh, I mean, you can keep, we have um, uh, updates regularly on our website, whisper.exposedfacts.org. You can get updates on what's going on with Daniel there um, and see what other kinds of work that we're doing. Um, all of these organizations that have been mentioned need support. We're all struggling and fighting, you know, and doing so with very thin budgets and 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 meager meager armies compared to the the kinds of people that we're that we're up against. So um, it's a collective effort. Thank you, Danica and Code Pink, for organizing this and for having the back of so many whistleblowers over the years. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what I take away from this. I mean, it really does take a village and we're this very particularized sliver of a village. So I'm glad to be in solidarity with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Um, feel free to share this all over and please stay involved in anti-war work so we can take what whistleblowers have given us and turn it into the change that they so very wanted to see. Um, hope you all have a great evening and I will talk to you all soon. Bye, good night. <laughs>